This is part 6 of our online video tutorial, Introduction to Optics and Lens Design. In this section, I'm going to talk about the use of aspheric surfaces in lenses. Um, they're, they're not often used. Most designs use only spherical surfaces for some very simple reasons. They're easier to manufacture, easier to measure, and simpler to design. Here's a, an example of um, some lenses being polished. And you'll notice that th they do this by grinding um, a tool or a lens on top of something with a matching, uh, with a matching curvature. And since only spherical surfaces will fit at all orientations, the, uh, the final surface is automatically spherical in shape. That makes them easy to manufacture. But sometimes an asphere is called for. For example, in a simple design like the Newtonian telescope, the Cassegrain telescope, Richard Crichan. Or it's also useful when you're going to use molded plastic optics, such as is shown here. Now, the molds are very expensive to make, very difficult to make, but once you've got the mold right, <coughs> you can just pour plastic in and make lenses for pennies a piece. So in high volume and small sizes, these are the kind of lenses that are used in uh, cell phone cameras. Now, in this lesson, we're going to work up a design for a schmidt cassegrain telescope. And this one has two aspherics, the corrector plate and the secondary mirror, right here. So we're, we'll develop it one step at a time. First, here is a telescope with a spherical mirror and a curved image surface. Uh, for now, the window is, is uh, on fr in front is flat on both sides. The stop is on surface 1, which is located at the center of curvature of the primary mirror. Now, since all the curved surfaces are concentric about the same point, there is no unique optical axis. And therefore, there are no off-axis aberrations, which is a rather, rather brilliant concept. Here's the input file for that. It's a very simple design, and only four surfaces. Although there are no off-axis aberrations, the spherical aberration is very large. And Bernard Schmidt realized that if you put an aspheric plate at the center of curvature, it would correct the spherical aberrations all over the field at about the same way. So let's see what kind of aspheric shape we can put on the corrector plate. In the, we can make an a, a optimization macro. In the parameter file, we're going to vary the second radius and the conic constant on surface 2, correct a sagittal um, grid of rays, and correct the HH at the 0.707 zone. I'll explain that in a minute, and then optimize. So we start by adding a conic constant. The GSI request uh, corrects the x coordinate, and the HH aberration corrects the tangent of the ray angle at the 0.707 zone at the on axis object right there. You can type help HH to read about all the items you can correct by tracing a single ray, and you get a, uh, a help file which shows this. Let's run that optimization. And here's what you see. With a flat corrector plate, a lot of aberration. With the added conic constant, it's about 10 times better. But it's not good enough yet. We have to do more. Let's back up. What was that HH aberration doing there? <coughs> well, it's simple. If the corrector plate has net optical power, <coughs> it will have chromatic aberration too. The target on HH makes the power go to zero at the zone where half the area is inside and half out. We need another aspheric term. Now, the basic aspheric formula in synopsis is a simple power series, as, as shown here from the help file. And we're going to vary term G3. That's the fourth power term, right there. Right there. And we run the optimization, and we, well, the image is 10 times better yet. What does it look like when we look at the OPD errors? Well, it's over two ways. It's not good enough. Let's try, let's try term G6, the sixth power term. G terms 3, <coughs> 3, 6, 10, and 16s are the ones used for most aspheric lenses. Well, it's better still, but is there anything else we can do? Yeah, here's an idea. We can change the GSR aberrations into three GSO requests. Those will target the OPD errors <coughs> in colors P, 1, and 3. Also, we don't need the AHH aberration now, because it was intended to do the same thing. So we comment that out, put an ex exclamation point here, and this, this line is then bypassed. Now the image is much better. And this is about all we can do with this form. The correction is not perfect in red and blue, since the index of the corrector plate is not the same as in the green. Wait a minute. What's an OPD error? That means optical path difference. 
A perfect wavefront will have the same path length from object to image for all rays. Any difference shows up as an aberration and an image blur. So this is the classical Schmidt telescope. <clears throat> has a curved image surface. And to use this, astronomers had to bend a glass photographic plate to that shape. And they did it, and sometimes they got away with it. They made very sharp images all over the field. But the image is internal. It's, it's hard to get at without blocking a lot of light. So now we've got to try to solve these problems. And indeed, there is a way you can add a secondary mirror. It moves the image behind the primary mirror and flattens the image surface. And the corrective plate doesn't have to be this at the center of curvature anymore, which is a, a more compact package. So let's improve it by changing it to a schmidt cassegrain configuration. This will be our starting design. There's no aspherics yet. We have five surfaces on the lens and a really bad image. Well, what did you expect? We haven't designed it yet. Let's see if this optimization will, pro will improve things. We're going to vary the radius and conic constant on surface 4, which is the, sec the secondary mirror. Right there, we'll vary that. And again, we start with ready-made merit function number 6. And we run this. Uh, wait a minute. First, make a checkpoint, because you never know when things don't work out as you hope. So we run this, and whoops, the image plane moved inside. And there's an important lesson here. The program will do absolutely anything it can in order to reduce the merit function. And sometimes it's something that you did not expect, and something th you don't want it. So we uh, glad we made a checkpoint. We go back, and we're going to add some, some more things to the merit function. This says minimize to target of 4 with a weight of 1, add thickness 3, and add thickness 4. See, notice how you can combine quantities in the merit function. You can add, subtract, multiply, and divide. So you run this macro, and now the image plane is outside. It, this uh, sum of uh, thickness 3 plus 4 comes out to here. That's this distance right in here. So now it's uh, the image is external where, where, where we want it. But there's still lots of coma off-axis. We need some more variables. What do we do? Of course, the corrector plate is still flat. I didn't, I didn't vary that yet. Let's add some aspheric terms to surface 2. And for this exercise, I'm going to use Zernike terms instead of power series terms. You can type help Zernike to read about it. Uh, there are 36 available polynomials. We only want those that are axially symmetric, which are given in, in, in this list. So we have to define surface 2 as a Zernike surface, and then we'll be able to vary those terms. So in the worksheet, you navigate to surface 2, click the, server, uh, the curvature dialog button, you click here, make it a Zernike polynomial surface, and you can... S uh, it's a good idea to set the unit aperture to the aperture that you're actually using, which is 5.5 inches in, in this case. So you set that, set, uh, click OK and close. Now it's as defined as a Zernike surface. And actually, you didn't have to go through all that. You could just type here in the, in the pane, 2 Zernike 5.5, and do the same thing. Either way, now you can, <coughs> you can vary the Zernike terms. But how do you do that? Well, it's simple. Term G3 now refers to Zernike term 3, and so on. So modify your macro, adding new G variables, 3, age 15, and so on, and make a checkpoint and run it. Well, that's interesting. The image is much better, but it has a strange ripple near the end. Why is that? Well, our grid had only three rays in it. And if things happen in between those rays, well, they're not under control. So the offending rays were missed by that grid. So we're going to change the grid number to 6 in all of our field requests and run it again. Right there. Ah, oh, that's much better. But is it good enough? A look at the OPD fans tells us a lot. Set a pad to look at the OPDs, and you get this curve. On axis, it's, it's, it's pretty good, but there's a lot of, co a lot of off-axis aberration here. It looks like this construction cannot make the field perfectly flat. So we're going to add a new variable to the parameter file, 5 radius. That's the, the, the radius of curvature of the image plane, and then re-optimize. Now it looks like this. Indeed, if the field is allowed to curve just slightly, we get almost perfect imaging on axis and just over a quarter wave at the edge of the field. Now, a young observer looking through an eyepiece will have no trouble focusing his eye all over the field, and it will look sharp. 
And that's why this is such a popular kind of uh, telescope for the amateur user. Well, wait a minute. I said earlier that an out-of-focus image makes straight lines on the fan's curve, and those were curved. What's going on? Well, the fan's curves of a defocused image are straight lines if you plot the transverse aberrations, like that. But if you're plotting OPDs, they're curved, like that. And the reason is because the OPD plot is the integral of the transverse aberrations plot. And you can think of it as showing the shape of the wavefront relative to a perfect wave, as you see here. Now let's work on an optics problem. We, s we uh, allege that a young viewer would be able to focus his eye all over the field. How much refocus is required? Now let's use some knowledge of optics. First we need the sag of the image surface. So you type sag 5, surface 5, and here's a sag table. At the edge of the, uh, of the surface we have a sag of about 0.159 thousandths of an inch. Now let's assume the, the user has an eyepiece of 1 inch focal length. And we know this is the um, Newtonian form of the, um, of, of the lens equation. We know that the product of S1 and S2 are equal to the focal length squared. So if S1 is this, this, the sag difference here that we found, and F is 1 inch, then S2 is, is this, or 62.735 inches, which is as many millimeters. Now, since one diopter of focus is 1 meter, the eye has to focus at 1 over that, or 0.628 diopters, which is simple. A young eye will have no trouble with that at all. Now let's get a listing of this design. We can type spec or click in the sidebar there. And here's a listing showing the, uh, the lens uh, specifications. And there's two sections. Uh, the, this, this is the first section giving the uh, surface system and surface data. And there's another section giving the aspherics, and you can also get that with the command asy. There you see the values of the values of the Zernike coefficients the optimization has found. They're all very small. And also the common constant on surface 4 right there. Let's see what those Zernike uh, surface, uh, what those Zernike terms look like. We, we can hit the command here. The surface profile of surface 2 with some arguments, and this is the shape of that Zernike surface that we saw for the corrector. And now you can also look at it as a contour plot, and it looks like this. And that uh, concludes our lesson on aspheric surfaces. Thanks for your attention.